Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Davida Strackbein. I'm chair of the board of the Greenwich Historical Society. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. Thank you for uh, joining us on behalf of both the Greenwich Historical Society and the Greenwich Point Conservancy, which, thanks to Chris Franco, facilitated today's lecture on Bertha Potter Boeing and the key role she played in American commercial aviation. Lecturer Barbara Hiscox Babe, here, uh, will take us from Todd's Point to the Jet Age. For those unaware, the Greenwich Historical Society is a private, nonprofit organization founded in 1931, just down the street uh, in the Prague Memorial Library on the first floor. It relocated in 1957 to its current site at the Bush Holly House, 39 Strickland Road in Kozkov. That site is the only national historic landmark in the town of Greenwich. Our campus today includes eight buildings, including a former privy, <laughs> on a site currently being reimagined. And the newest building is being expanded to meet the escalating needs for preservation of history in the town of Greenwich. Please feel free to take the handouts on your seats, which will provide further information on the organization. And if you have any questions about the capital campaign, Peter Malkin, <laughs> our, our chair, <laughs> has joined us this morning. Um, but the flyer will also tell you about some of the upcoming exhibitions, and I just want to talk about one. It's opening on April 5th in the original Bush um, 1805 storehouse, and it's about Jane and Jim Henson, the late presidents of Greenwich, uh, creators of The Muppets and contributors to the groundbreaking public television show we all know and loved over the years, Sesame Street. It will include puppets and paintings, photographs, and archival films. Um, the president of the Greenwich Point Conservancy, Chris Franco, raise your hand, although I'm sure everyone knows him, right? He invited the Historical Society to co-sponsor today's special talk to celebrate Women's History Month. Women's History Month was first officially proclaimed in 1987 after a long struggle to achieve national recognition for the extraordinary achievements of American women. Since 1988, U.S. presidents have issued annual proclamations designating the month of March as Women's History Month. But Women's History Week came first. In President, in 1980, President Jimmy Carter's proclamation stated why, quote, from the first settlers who came to our shores, from the American Indian families who befriended them, men and women have worked together to build this nation. Too often the women were unsung, and sometimes their contributions went unnoticed. But the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who built America was as vital as that of the men whose names we know so well. <laughs> it is appropriate that we are at this site today because the site traces its beginnings back to an extraordinary woman settler named Elizabeth Winthrop Feek. Although the site is known today as Greenwich Point, it was her particular purchase as one of the founders of the town of Greenwich immortalized in the founder's July 18, 1640 deed, which has been replicated and mounted on a boulder <laughs> just beyond the beach um, in uh, Greenwich. And in it, her particular purchase was named by, quote, Ye Indians, Monica Wake, and by her fellow settlers as Elizabeth's Neck. Over the past 13 years, the Greenwich Point Conservancy has, through their outstanding preservation efforts, restored the 19th 
and 20th century J. Kennedy Todd family's <coughs> era at the site, including the circa 1903 Innes Arden Cottage, which we are enjoying today, and the circa 1887 Old Barn, AKA the beautiful Susie Baker mm -hmm. Pavilion, and we have Susie with us today, for, the, um, uh, for which the Historical Society will be honoring the Greenwich Point Conservancy on May 7th at our 30th annual Greenwich Landmark Recognition event. We hope you will all join us at the event to honor them. Now I'd like to introduce Chris Franco, the co-founder and president of the Greenwich Point Conservancy since its founding 13 years ago, who will introduce the speaker. Perspective and introduction. On behalf of the Greenwich Point Conservancy, I'd like to thank you all for attending, and we would like to thank the Greenwich Historical Society for co sponsoring this third lecture in a series of lectures that we have co sponsored with the Historical Society that have featured prominent women who have been important in their fields and who are connected to Innes Arden Cottage. Um, in 2012, we featured Catherine C. Budd, who was the architect of the Innes Arden Cottage. She was one of the very early pioneers in, of, of uh, women uh, architects. And in fact, she was the first uh, female to be admitted to the New York State American Institute of Architects. Uh, so she was, she was a great woman, and she did a great job with this building. In 2013, we featured Anna Maxwell, who was the founding director of the New York Presbyterian Hospital School of Nurses and has been acknowledged as one of the most important nurses in American history. Uh, she's known as the American Florence, Florence Nightingale and she was one of the first women to be uh, buried in Arlington National Cemetery uh, in honor of the fact that she was able to achieve officer status for nurses. And so during, from 1906 until 1913, uh, Anna Maxwell and the nurses from the New York Presbyterian Hospital were the uh, exclusive residents of this building. Uh, Mr. Todd offered it to the nurses during this, from May 1st until uh, December uh, 1st of each year so that they had a place to um, get away from the heat of the city. And in fact, we have reproduced and enlarged an article from the New York Tribune in 1906, uh, wherein Mr. Todd announced that the nurses would be having the exclusive use of the Ennis Arden Cottage during that period. The, uh, 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 not the focus of the article, but there is also uh, a mention that the Ennis Arden Cottage had, built, had been built a couple of years, a few years earlier for Mrs. Todd's uh, sister-in-law who was widowed and her three daughters and that's the subject of our conversation today. Um, we're fortunate to have Barbara Hiscock Spaith with us, Bobby Spaith, and Bobby will talk about her illustrious family including her great aunt Mrs. Maria T uh, Potter Todd, Mrs. Todd of the J. Kennedy Todd, and um, also uh, Bobby's great grandmother and grandmother, who, with their with her two great aunts, were the initial uh, <laughs> residents of the Innes Arden Cottage. Mr. and Mrs. Todd built the cottage for uh, Bobby's family, and they occupy. Well, you'll tell much more detail about that. <laughs> but I want to tell you a little bit about Bobby. Bobby's a Seattle resident and a graduate of the University of Washington. She began her career in journalism as the first female on-air television news reporter for KING-TV, the Seattle NBC affiliate, and went on to win an Emmy at KOMO, which was the Seattle ABC affiliate, and became the first female radio news director in the region. Bobby is the author of several local histories and has been active in Seattle historic preservation and is currently the national historian for the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. So Bobby, we're very grateful to have you today. This, this is a three-fisted job, I can see. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Are there any potters in the audience? Really? Terrific. Yeah. Wonderful. Nice to meet you, cousin. It's a big family. Um, and I am going to start right here um, because this is your backyard, but we're going to go 50 years ahead. Let's see if I can get this right. That's right. Because in this 50 year span, my great, my great aunt, which was my grandmother's sister, and was, went from this cottage to christening the prototype of the 707 in Seattle, which was the big transition. And believe me, her life was one big fast forward. Now, when you can wonder why is a young man uh, from New York City uh, in Tacoma, Washington in 1894. Um, and his sister, of course, was back here, uh, as would most of his family. His father and mother were in London because his father was a director of the Bank of England and was partner in Brown Shipley and also Brown Brothers Bank in New York City. Uh, this young man was in his 20s, and uh, they sent him west to the terminus of the northern of the great nor uh, of the Northern Pacific Railroad, which was uh, involved financially with both his family and the Todds. And uh, he was expected to invest uh, his family's money uh, on their behalf. He purchased uh, an interest in something called the Crescent Creamery and uh, fell in love with a young woman whose family had come out from the Midwest. Her father was a grain broker from Chicago named Charles Kershaw. Her mother was a Connecticut Yankee. Uh, whose name was Leavenworth, from, um, the, originally from here, and they uh, had a large family, and uh, he and Alice Kershaw were married in 1889 in uh, Tacoma, Washington. Uh, they're a charming couple. Um, that's uh, Mrs. Todd's brother, uh, Howard Cranston Potter, and his bride, Alice Kershaw, um, and they soon had three daughters. They, oh, by the way, the family purchased this or built this house for them. It overlooked the bay in Tacoma, alas, now torn down too bad. But a really grand house for a young married couple. Mm -hmm. By 1895, there were three daughters, uh, my grandmother being the baby on the corner there, and Alice in the middle is Bertha, who would grow up to be the center of our attention here, and then Melissa, named for her Aunt Maria Todd. Um, and she, with her father there. Now this is a happy family, but unfortunately tragedy struck. The panic of 1895 bankrupted his business. His father-in-law, Mr. Kershaw, took him, I think, reluctantly into his grain brokerage business. And in 1896, he decided to take a business trip to San Francisco. It was really not a good idea. Uh, he was, his body was found on the beach below the Cliff House restaurant uh, uh, with a large hole in the back of his skull. Uh, unfortunately, there was a private detective who was, just happened to be in uh, San Francisco who knew several of the parties that he was visiting, and uh, it was a rather lurid account. Um, it was all in the uh, Tacoma newspapers, which was, of course, a dreadful shock to the family. Um, he was seen in the company of a lady of some dubious repute, and witnesses were quoted saying that he was seeking funds from his business associate for a carousal. Um, this did not make life very easy for the Potter Kershaw family in Tacoma. The Chronicle, of course, this news was all over the country. It was just dreadful, and it was in, uh, made even more worrisome because his uncle was the Bishop of New York for the Episcopal Church. Um, there were several other prominent members of this family, and of course, the Brown Brothers Bank. Well, it was noted that he didn't have any money, but he had a life insurance policy. Fortunately, the Potter family was extremely loyal, and his brother, James Brown Potter, who had come out for his wedding, came out and calmed things down. An inquest was held. It was, shall we say, sketchy, but the whole thing ended up with a verdict of accidental death, which it certainly was. This is what the three sisters looked like at the time of uh, just shortly after their father's death. Um, my grandmother is the little blonde in the corner. Uh, Bertha is the one at the top, and Mary, uh, Maria, who's named after Mrs. Todd, on the left right after my great-grandfather's death, 
Um, his parents both died within a year of each other, and so at that moment there was a terrific dispersal of funds in the family, a generational shift, if you will. And uh, the girls had a modest trust, and of course all of their wealthy father's money came down to Mrs. Todd and her siblings that were surviving. About 1903, when the decision was made by the uh, Todds to become more directly involved in the uh, in the lives of their nieces. Um, this is what the girls looked like. I think that absolutely astounding dresses and charming, charming girls. And they were, believe it or not. Uh, and they were invited to come and live here. I have some letters at home of correspondence. One summer they kept the gatehouse for Aunt Rhea, as she was known to our family. And uh, they were uh, growing up and they were promptly enrolled in Rosemary Hall which was a very progressive school for women at that time. And uh, that was uh, their big leap uh, out of Tacoma, Washington, and into a wider world. Um, they, of course, did spend summers in the West. And here they are going up to their maiden aunt, Jessie Kershaw's cabin. She was a maiden lady school marm. And uh, I just love the picture of Mount Rainier behind them. And uh, they, so they had a very diverse up upbringing. Now, they also got the Grand Tour. And it was a, they didn't finish Rosemary Hall, I understand, but they were finished uh, in Europe <laughs> with, a, with a school. And I love the corset. Oh, my goodness, Aunt Bertha never looked like that that I ever saw her. But this was her at 18. And of course, she was like her sisters, being prepared for a society kind of a life with to find the right husband and whatnot. And we wondered if she might end up you know, in New York society. I mean, why not? She had a big family here supportive of her, but it didn't work out that way. Her grandfather in Tacoma became very ill, and the grand touring ended abruptly when they were telegraphed. They received a cable that he was dying, and they returned to Tacoma. And by then, Bertha's looking at being 19, and her sister, Melissa, uh, was was almost 18, and so a debutante party was organized. And there were, believe it or not, quite a large number of young um, Ivy League educated gentlemen who were making fortunes in the Seattle area, specifically uh, the, the panic was long gone. Um, the Alaska gold rush had brought huge amounts of capital. There were now three or four railroads there. It was a big boom town. And as things would happen, Bertha was proposed to by a Harvard man named Nathaniel Paschal, whose family came uh, to make money from uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so she was married the summer of 1911. She was 20 years old. And her life was just, uh, excuse me there, I hit the wrong button. She uh, had a lovely summer place. This is a garden picture. Let's see, I know this is the pointer. This is Bertha here, her little son Nat Jr., her husband Nathaniel, various friends at this gorgeous place where they lived. Uh, in the summertime on Bainbridge Island, looking down at Mount Rainier in one way into the Seattle skyline on the other. All looks terrific, doesn't it? Well, well, in her scrapbook, in her handwriting, <clears throat> is a notation in 1917 about the visit of a Boeing airplane to a place called American Lake, which is where her mother lived. And it was a uh, very gracious area, obviously landed on a field. It's the beginning of World War I. And uh, this fellow has come to show off his airplane. Hmm. Now, who was Bill Boeing anyway? And what was he doing in Seattle, Washington? Well, he came there on a whim. He had been born in Detroit. He was the son of very wealthy German immigrants. His family had made a lot of money in lumber. And when their compasses were not working well in the forest, they were found out that underneath the stumps was the Masabi Iron Ore Range, which made him very, very wealthy indeed, his family. Uh, his father died when he was eight years old. His mother remarried. And they thought it would be a good idea for Bill to go to Europe and study in Switzerland which he did. Returned home, went to Yale, and when he turned 22 and came into his own fortune from this inheritance, he said goodbye to Yale, figuring he did not need another year, and headed west on a complete whim where his father owned, had purchased timberland, sight unseen, and he started a logging company in a little town called Hoquiam, which is closer to Portland than Seattle, and founded a company called Greenwood Lumber. 
Well, that was kind of an adventurous thing. He was 22, 23 years old. And he soon began to meet other like-minded Ivy League type fellows and uh, joined the Men's University Club in Seattle and decided Seattle was a little more sophisticated than Oakwim and uh, began to meet a lot of these fellows. Well, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Pascoe was a member of the Men's University Club too and there was no socializing and he had friends at the country club on Bainbridge where the Pascals lived and when the war was over, his airplane company that he had started as a hobby because he and a friend at the university club thought they could build a better plane to play with than they could buy, and they did. And then he got a military contract for this hobby of his, and young men from the University of Washington who wanted to make a career in aviation went to work, and he had the money, and they had the time and talent. So they were beginning to think of new ventures. Well, the military business was over. All the contracts were canceled, and Bill Boeing decided to take an adventure with his test pilot, Eddie Hubbard, standing on the left, and they decided to do the first international airmail flight for the United States to Victoria, Canada, which is about 100 miles away. <laughs> it wasn't exactly, uh, you know, Lindbergh, but it, and of course it put him on the front page of papers all over the country, and this man was shy very shy and very private. But here he was, aviation and uh, adventure had carried him into public view. Well, this is what Aunt Bertha looked like about this time. And uh, you know, Bill Boeing wasn't a logger lover. He was a gentleman and his, my cousin, his son, Bill said to me once, you can always spot dad in the picture, he's the one in the clean shirt. <laughs> and even in logging camp pictures, he's the man in the clean shirt. So he was obviously, I think, impressed with my Aunt Bertha. She'd had an East Coast experience. She was close to her family in the East. She had been to Europe. She had been to Swiss boarding school. They were, thing I think they were on the same page as we say today. Well. The hobby continued, and although he was a very private person, and he was the only bachelor in his community, he built a beautiful home, I mean, it was a mansion, and had plenty of servants and a chauffeur and whatnot, but he was the only bachelor, and until he wasn't. <laughs> well, when some people go courting, they go courting, you know, car, whatever, especially in 1919, but, his airplane company was running in the red. He could afford to keep it going. And they were diversifying. They were building furniture. They were trying other things. And they decided to try speedboats, which actually worked out pretty well because he sold them all because it was prohibition. And there were a lot of people who were excited to own a boat that would go 45 miles an hour between Canada and Seattle. But that's really not part of the story because <laughs> what happened was um, uh, a guy who some of you have ever had any experience rowing, uh, George Pocock, who built <laughs> racing shells and is our famous Seattle hero of the boys in the boat, uh, if anybody's read that book. But George had a wonderful biography done, and that kind of uh, uh, gave us a clue about when the relationship between my Aunt Bertha Boeing and my Aunt Bertha Potter Pascal uh, became Mrs. Boeing because George in his, uh, in his biography was quoted directly saying that about 1919, um, Mr. Boeing wanted that first speedboat for himself so he could go uh, courting on Bainbridge Island. Um, and it was a little hard to keep that sort of activity a secret because all of the children on the country club would come out to see Bill Boeing's speedboat coming for Mrs. Pascal. <laughs> And Bill Boeing didn't usually go to the plant to watch anything being built, but this time he did. Well, once upon a time, here we go, um, the secret was out, and on the front page of the society pages, Seattle man weds. And uh, it's now, let me see here. He headline was there, but it's all about Bertha Potter Pascal becoming Mrs. William E. Boeing. And my grandmother, her sister, who also started here at at, uh, in 1903, um, 
was the best woman, and Mr. Hewitt, who was an old logging buddy from uh, Hoquiam, was the best man. And there was a big party. So uh, without much fuss, it was one day after her divorce was final, and uh, the waiting period of six months was up uh, that the wedding happened in the court in Seattle. Well, <clears throat> I think this is the funniest picture I have ever seen in a photo album. Uh, um, of a new father. Um, as you can see, it was not an experience with which he was familiar. <laughs> and he is, again, the guy with the clean shirt in the picture. And that's, of course, his son, Bill, in his lap, which was a, a great joy uh, to them both. And with plenty of servants and plenty of uh, resources, um, my Aunt Bertha, who started in this cottage and got finished, came back and changed her life. Uh, was absolutely transformed and became her husband's confidant and totally involved in everything he did, including off into the woods. She loved to draw pictures of herself, and she has many journals. And here she is in her outdoor clothes, her men's outdoor clothes, uh, in the forest uh, with Bill, and uh, complained that her outfit, which was designed for a man, was too tight in some places and too loose in other places. <laughs> now, the Potter sisters, these are the girls who look so gorgeous, weren't they cute? Well, now they're all grown up, and boy, did they have a good time in the 1920s. Let's just say prohibition did not get in their way. Um, here's my grandmother. By then, they all have kids. They're all married. Um, Grace, my grandmother here, um, has four children, my, my father being one of them. Um, Melissa, Maria Louisa, had four sons, and Aunt Bertha, of course, now had three. And notice Aunt Bertha is smoking. Oh, still a scandal. Um, Melissa had the biggest struggle of the sisters. Um, she had an older husband who was not doing well, and she herself physically was not doing well. And Aunt, Mali Aunt Rhea, Todd, was a financial and a emotional support to her. Their mother was very ill and died. Alice Kershaw, the potter, died very shortly after this picture was taken. And really, I believe that Maria Todd was the surrogate mother for these girls throughout their adult lives. And she lived on quite a long time. Uh, but especially, it was true of the middle daughter, uh, aunt, my Aunt Melissa. Well, as we know, the, the military figured out that they couldn't quit building airplanes just because the war was over. And Boeing began to get great contracts, and they were soon out of the red. And on they went. But a lot of those young men were aware of the fact that the government was thinking about how to start commercial aviation in America. And the way they were going to do it was through the post office, which was a wonderful source of political patronage throughout the country in those days. Every postmaster was appointed by the political com campaign that had won the presidential election. And they also decided to grant airmail contracts that would effectively subsidize the development of passenger air travel. So they put out different routes. And the boys at the plant wanted to bid on the route from San Francisco to Chicago. And they had to persuade Bill Boeing to do that. Now, you didn't see Bill Boeing at the plant. If you wanted to talk to him, you came to the Hogue Building in downtown Seattle, where he had his offices in the financial district. So the two guys, Claire Egbert, who was the chief engineer, and Eddie Hubbard, that pilot, marched up there with their plans and their numbers and their figures and their estimates and got a very bad reception. This was not something Bill Boeing was excited about. He said, it's not in our experience. And the two men walked out of the office. And these are numerous historical accounts of this. And they figured they had not made a sale. However, <laughs> Bill Boeing went home. And as he did with everything, he talked it over with his wife. And for those who in Hamilton who were in the room, if anybody's heard that song or know the story, the accounts are absolutely sure that it was she who persuaded him to do this, to, the, to bid this contract and to enter in the competition to build commercial air travel in America. It was a big adventure. It started in December, and it had to be done by July. 
What made, the, what made the difference, I love this picture. So they were able to get these fabulous engines. Here we go. Oh, wait a minute. That, you want to, there's Bill back there. Here. I don't know who these guys are, but Bill and then Annie B with her bottle of lemonade. That she really was mad about that because it was prohibition. Um, yeah, I did. At <laughs> any rate, uh, oop, wait a minute. I have to go back. Pratt & Whitney was making a, an innovative new engine that was air-cooled. And that's why Boeing's bid came in so low. He had to post a half a million dollar bond before the post office would believe he had the capacity to do the job. And they awarded it, but he had to post a personal bond to, to guarantee his performance. Well, this engine was weighed a whole lot less, and they didn't have to carry water you know, radiator things, so they could bid lower and make more money, and they never looked back. This business was profitable through the entire Depression. And it was time for doing the things that happen today in high tech. They were buying each other out. They were scaring people out. They were amalgamating and making partnerships to build a system. And Boeing partnered. First of all, Uncle Bill decided to start his own bank so he could control the fact they had to go public and get stockholders. This was big. So he partnered with Fred Rentschler. Is there any Rentschlers in the room? No. Are there? Ah, oh, OK. At any rate, he apparently was a terrific lot of fun. And he also built great, great engines. And so he and Chance Vought and my great uncle sat down. And, and as the historical account, oops, the historical account points out uh, in 1942, it was of the club soda variety. Well, it was during Prohibition. And I'm sure there was more involved here than club soda. And Bertha and Bill Boeing were leaders in the repeal Prohibition campaign, as you could guess. Now, Aunt Bertha, it was time, Uncle Bill thought, for a reward. And so he decided to build her a yacht. And he did, in Canada. And he called it the Taconite, after the iron ore that made him a wealthy man. And here we have my grandmother swinging the champagne. It's Canada. Little Bill, Uncle Bill, Aunt Bertha with her fur wrap, and her two sons from her first marriage, that's uh, Nat Pascal Jr. and Cranston, named for her father, who we all called Boo. I'm sorry we did. And he's a wonderful man, but what a terrible nickname. Any rate, this is what it looked like. That's a nice reward for inspiring your husband to take the right steps with an adventure. And I can testify personally, it was terrific to be on. I got taken on a week's cruise with three or four of my other cousins and my sister by Aunt Bertha when she was then a widow. And uh, boy, that was an experience of a lifetime. It's 125 feet long, and it's still afloat, I think, in the Caribbean. Believe me, everything on that boat, including a crew of 11 and a Danish chef. Now, Aunt Bertha would have been a journalist if she had lived in this era. Here she is with her 16 millimeter movie camera on the taconite. She wrote, she had a typewriter, she typed beautifully, she did journals. Um, and uh, they are, one of them has been reproduced by my aunt and is uh, available through the Museum of Flight in Seattle of her very many adventures. Now, she also believed in promoting aviation safety. Here she is with Amelia Earhart, who visited Seattle. And of course, this is the United Airlines. The company then was Boeing Aircraft, United Airlines, Tikorsky, uh, Ling Temko, you know, the whole thing in a helicopter, in a propeller company, I mean, you know, and the bank. So it was, they had it all together. Mm -hmm. And this gent here was my neighbor eventually in retirement. He, Ed, Eric Nelson was a around the world hero in World War I pilot and was one of Boeing's very favorite test pilots and a terrific guy. And here's Annie B doing what she really liked to do. We're out of the corset. We're, we're out of the uh, lace uh, dresses. Uh, we're in our jeans. She has great fish here. What would happen is that they would bring um, the mail and correspondence to Bill and Bertha up on their yacht, wherever they were, in some remote inlet. And then the amphibious plane would fly them up to a lake, and they could go fishing up there, or they could go fishing out wherever. It was a nice life. <laughs> and the boys were growing up. Here she is, uh, very, very supportive mother, a terrific mom. Uh, there's no doubt Bill Boeing was a formal person, and he was a formal father. 
Uh, but she, I think, more than made up for it, and she was enormously regarded for her generosity in Seattle and with the company because she would then put on Christmas parties for the employees' children, and she took books and other materials to the logging camp uh, uh, installations. She was a totally active uh, morale builder for Bill Boeing's business enterprises. And here, I love this, is probably the last time she ever appeared in a newspaper article except in her obituary. And here she is. There is a, it was a benefit party. Uh, where they were demolishing a Victorian mansion. And her son, Nat, is here. Uh, this guy here, when my grandfather died very abruptly at the age of 41, he was the idea man, invented many of the technologies for safety for the Boeing Airplane Company. Total accident, but it happened. And he died of a cerebral aneurysm uh, in New York and at, uh, sorry, in Chicago at age 41. And eventually, this very nice, charming guy became my step grandfather and married Grace, her baby sister. It was a good friend of Bill Boeing's as well, and a lumber baron from Everett. Well, the end of the Boeing aviation story for him was 1934. Roosevelt had been elected. The whole system of how those airline routes for the airmail was then revealed to the Democrats who were outraged that the government picked winners and losers. But what they did was pick the strongest bidders uh, that they felt could succeed, and that caused a great furor. It was an inside deal, they said. They called Bill Boeing before a Senate investigation committee and excoriated him. And uh, Bill Boeing wasn't used to that. He really wasn't. And he got up from the whole experience and left and sold every share he owned in the Boeing Airplane Company, turned over the management to the men he'd brought along, and never owned the company after 1934. So what do they do? I mean, they were he was in his mid late 50s, retiring a little young. Aunt Bertha was in her late 40s. Well, they got into horse racing. They got into family. They got into the taconite, of course. And they raised purebred cattle in a big ranch uh, in the foothills of the Cascades east of Seattle. And they did philanthropy in a very quiet and very effective way. Um, after, during World War II, he did return to the Boeing Company as an unpaid consultant and helped during the war, but that was really his last big adventure. So they were really retired, and the Boeing Company comes out of World War II, you know, big heroes, but what do you do? Next, it's peacetime again, and the diversification this time. It's an adventurous company. Now, oh, by the way, the kids grew up. There's my cousin Bill and his then wife, Marcy, and there's Uncle Bill and Aunt Bertha in their later years. So what happened is the Boeing Company bet the farm. They took two-thirds of every profit they had after World War II and put it into the development of a jet commercial passenger airliner. And so in recognition of my great aunt's key role in convincing Boeing to go into commercial aviation, she was called to take the champagne bottle and whack it across the bow of the Dash 80 prototype in 1954 and was the, uh, was the ceremonial sponsor of the jet age for, transfer, for passengers. And there it was. It was a big crowd. She had a big crowd. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot more, but it would wear you all out, and me too. So I'll be glad to take questions. Yes. My father always said that was Aunt Bertha's project. Mm -hmm. And uh, it probably was. I mean, she. The question? Oh, Innes Arden. Uh, there is an, 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 a big, big uh, suburban development north on the, of the city on the water, like this, only a little on the cliff and then down, um, called Innes Arden. And of course, she picked the name absolutely because of her memories of living here as a child and enjoying this beautiful setting. And Puget Sound's pretty good, too. Uh, but yes, absolutely, and it's a very popular neighborhood, uh, and it's it's just simply lovely. It's south of Everett and north of the city. Now it's in now it's in the city of Shoreline. Yeah, yeah. Do any other of your family members do what you do? You know, sort of go around. No, <laughs> no. Um, my uh, my sister is a retired uh, 
senior partner in a Seattle law firm, and uh, uh, my I have one cousin. They own a, the, my aunt Grace named lots of Graces in my family, um, and sh they own a big shipyard in Seattle and have lots of investments. And you know, no, I mean, um, oh, a lot of engineers. Um, there are a huge number of engineers in in our grandchildhood, um, and uh, but most of us are, and there's couple of people who just, you know, women who, one woman who just was a housewife, which is good for her because she's great kids. Um, but I think if Aunt Bertha had lived, she would, with her love of photography and her energy and her willingness to put herself out there to promote it. I mean, I thought a christening for an airplane in 1927, it wasn't an ocean liner, you know, and she knew it was good publicity. She just had that sense that she wanted to make these feel safe and have fun and, and get there in a big hurry. She liked getting there. She always drove. She didn't, she didn't sit back. And many of her generation never learned to drive. And uh, as I said, you saw her. She's on horseback. She's catching salmon. Um, she preferred that kind of an adventurous life rather than being um, a society matron, definitely. Yeah. Um, in 1934, when Boeing sold them, what, what was Congress telling him? What was he doing wrong? I mean, it was, was a monopoly, and it also was an inside dealing. They had a meeting in the room, as Hamilton's uh, protagonist, Mr. Um, Aaron Burr, said, I want to be in the room. And in the Republican administrations before, when they were setting up the airmail routes, um, they made deals. They made deals. And it, Bill was not in the room. But it, his men were. But it, they prohibited anyone who had been in that room from managing an airplane company. And so the head of United Airlines had to leave the company and went to work and started Air Canada. Uh, that's what happened. And he ca eventually came back to the US. But I mean, it was a tough a readjustment for the aviation industry that had started so small and so uh, entrepreneurial, uh, with an entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you may have already answered this, but when did other competing airlines begin? There were competing airlines everywhere. Um, American Airlines was going strong, uh, and they were bidding on another piece, the East Coast piece, which was certainly probably more profitable because of the population issues. The long haul fight, of course, they would have loved to have had. I'm trying to remember some of the other early airlines, but there were TWA, that's right, that's right, that's right. How narrow-minded we are in Seattle. What is there? You know? <laughs> and there's something beyond Boeing yet? <laughs> Pan Am has a lot of connections. Pan Am actually was, that was a different thing because it was not an American, it was not based on American routes. It was the overseas line. But it, uh, yes, you're right about that. TWA went into that too. And Pan American had a South American connection. Originally, Juan Trippi, I believe, was the name of the, of the man who ran, who was the charismatic man. Oh, really? Well, there's another connection aviation-wise. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about Mrs. Todd, since she was, they were responsible right, right. for bringing the Potter um, girls here? I can tell you that I never met her because she was gone before I was born. She, she, I just missed her. Um, but my father, uh, who was a teenager when they came out to visit the sisters, the aunts, she was formidable as far as he was concerned, but she had to be one of the most compassionate and generous people uh, because she was so generous and supportive, not just writing a check, but emotionally supportive of her nieces and her somewhat difficult brothers who'd had their challenges. Um, and, you know, but she, I would say that the Potter family stuck together. And I think that the, both Mr. Todd, who was enormously wealthy, and Mrs. Todd, who was enormously wealthy, had terrific, terrific philanthropic efforts. And they had no children of their own, and they focused on their family and supporting that younger generation, which made the total difference in the lives of Bertha Potter, her sisters, Melissa, definitely, and my grandmother, absolutely. One of the Potters founded Union College and connected it. That's correct. Um, well, no, actually, it was his father-in-law, who's also my ancestor, Eliphalet Knott. That's right. And uh, Howard Potter, Mrs. Todd's father, 
was a professor at Union, and then fell in love with his first cousin. Oops. And they got married, and they're the parents. Mrs. Todd's parents were first cousins. Um, and then, who was the daughter of James Brown, the banker. And so he left teaching because his father-in-law wanted him in the business. And he did become quite a star at Brown Brothers in his era and with the reciprocal firm in, in London. But yeah, uh, and that's a humongous big family. But yeah, Union College was where all of this kind of came together. And the Presbyterian, well, actually the Potters ended up being Episcopalians, but you know, well. Clark Clarkson, not Potter. Was it? Publisher. Absolutely, but his father was, or grandfather, was a United States congressman from New York City. And then Robert Potter, the oldest brother, this is the generation above, was a general in the Civil War and an attorney. Then the next one down was my ancestor Howard. Then there was uh, the, the bishop, Horatio and, uh, and uh, Henry Codman Potter, the bishop, who was a really wonderful progressive. And then there was a Liffelet Knott Potter, who was the president of Hobart College. And then, <laughs> and then there, there were several more. It's really, it's a big family and full of people who were involved in progressive things. If you go into the Metropolitan Museum of Art, you look up on the wall on those granite thing and you'll see Howard Potter's name there. That's Mrs. Todd's father. And they were super generous, civic-minded family in New York City in the Gilded Age. And I think that's what's so telling about Mrs. Todd and her husband, that they lived in the wealthiest time in per capita, I don't, to date in that history after the Civil War. And they gave so much of it to the community. And that was a huge legacy for, for, for New York and for you guys. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, she never did, and I was intrigued about that too, but you know, um, she kind of got what she wanted, which was the adventure and the influence, and it's, uh, and I watched Melinda Gates and Bill Gates, they had a program uh, night before last, or last night on uh, PBS, uh, and of course, um, their kids go to the same, he, his, mother, his mother and I were on the same, <laughs> Computers for older folks class. <laughs> Seattle's a small town. We, she said, I have to figure out what Bill's doing. We're learning how to write code and see. It was really hysterical. At any rate, um, but Melinda Gates said it was going to be a partnership, and she decided to be a stay-home mother, and I can understand totally that decision. And in Aunt Bertha's case, she had a complicated family life. Uh, her first marriage was very unhappy, and she had a man who wanted to marry her, and also took on her sons and did very well by them. He was a generous stepfather. He was a good husband. And she wanted to make that a success, and she certainly did. And he listened to her. He had no brothers. He had no father. He had no one he could confide in and discuss business ideas with. And when I said Innes Arden was Aunt Bertha's project, before that there was Blue Ridge and other I don't think he went into any decision without totally consulting her. And in the 30s, that was fine. She was very shy, too. I mean, when your father's on the front page of a newspaper, and you're old enough to know what that's about, and other things had happened in the Potter family I won't go into that put them on the front page in an unpleasant way, that you end up wanting to have privacy. And just like Jackie Onassis, he could give her a yacht and privacy, and he did. Could I ask a question back about Mr. Boeing? Yeah. And was, could you describe him as an inventor? Did he build airplanes? Was he a pilot? How did he get this business going? I mean, he was a timber man. What happened? No, he was not necessarily. Well, he loved being tim and timber. was fun, too. Bill Boeing was raised with a great deal of money. And Bill Boeing loved to think about ideas and to foster them. Bill Boeing did not build airplanes, but he hired good people who did. He supported innovation, 
technological innovation wherever he saw it. And my grandfather was one example because my grandfather invented the first two-way radio system from ground to plane, which made it possible for pilots to know that there was a storm up in Waukegan or something. Um, and so people, uh, but Bill Boeing was a manager and a, and, a, and a selector of talent. By the way, women always worked at the Boeing Airplane Company because in the beginning, they sewed the fabric together for the wings and they had women who ran, ran sewing machines, et cetera, and the women were also involved in the plans and managing the, the, di the diagrams and, the, and, the, and all the, the planning stuff. So there was a role for women, which was quite unusual. And by the way, by 1922, Boeing was the largest employer in Seattle. And uh, that was pretty, pretty astounding because it was not a small town then. It was almost 200,000 people. Yeah? In Chicago, there's a Potter, Pam, Potter Palmer family. Is that the thing you all do? I've tried to find out about that. And if it had been, it would be way back. Um, we had, there are a lot of potters. I don't think they are. I don't think they are either, no. Um, but uh, bishops and other ministers proliferated in the Potter family. <laughs> Occasional politicians. Um, and uh, it was, hmm, no. I wish they were, though. That was a kind of an affluent bunch. Yeah. Over there? Oh, yeah. In the early slide when there was the discussion about Eddie, his uh, pilot, and somebody else. Comes oh, Eddie Hubbard. Eddie Hubbard. And then there was a Claire. As well, a, Claire Egbert was a man, by okay, the way. I want to tell you that. He was a man. He was a, of Scandinavian extraction, of which an enormous part of Seattle is. Um, and he was at the University of Washington starting a, just a young fellow when Bill Boeing hired him, probably one of his best hires and, uh, and a, a terrific manager and design idea. He was the fellow who took the company from fabric sewing and, and wooden frames and moved it into the metal airplane uh, and uh, the, the higher and higher and higher tech. And believe me, they were changing their model designs every week. It was always something new. It was always something different. And they were competing around the country uh, three or four really high-powered manufacturing people, but Boeing was definitely in the forefront of design ideas. Um, and it's because of Claire and his team, definitely. Did, did you mention that the shell builder for University of Washington built the speedboats? Yes, he did, George Pocock. He started out building pontoons for the seaplanes. And Bill Boeing walked into the shop, which he rarely did, and saw what beautiful work they were doing at the University of Washington, because the university was looking for them to give maybe a contribution, which he did. Um, and they saw this man working on these beautiful rowing shells and said, whoa, and offered him a job. And so Pocock had to choose. At, at a certain point, when, when World War I ended, he decided that he really was a boatman and went back to the University of Washington where he built shells, not just for the U, but for also for all the kids back here. And uh, uh, yeah, but he was, he was a, a, real, a real artist and a real great guy. There we go. Thanks for coming.